Good morning and welcome to another edition of the Business of Metro Milwaukee. I'm Steve Boss, Senior Vice President for Government Affairs at the MMAC. I'm sitting in for Tim Sheehy, our president, who is on assignment today. Uh, this is our monthly webinar providing insights on the business of Greater Milwaukee. The series puts a spotlight on the challenges and opportunities uh, that we face sustaining and growing this region's prosperity. We hope these insights help you shape your business and in inspire you to uh, shape the region's future. Today, we've got a, a really great show for you. Um, we're really grateful to have a Representative Evan Goike and State Representative Jesse Rodriguez with us today. Um, they are members of the legislature's Joint Committee on Finance, and we're gonna be talking a little bit about the state budget and uh, the legislature is just about in the phase of writing their version of that state budget. And so we're pleased to have Jesse and Evan here to have a, a good discussion of that budget and what might, be, uh, what might be upcoming. Following that discussion, as always, we'll be joined by Dr. Raymond, president of the Medical College of Wisconsin for an update on the latest information surrounding COVID, COVID and the vaccine rollout. Uh, before we start with Evan and Jesse, I do want to have a word from our sponsor. Our, our program today is sponsored by United Healthcare. In times like these, a traditional health plan may not be the best fit for your business. And so we urge you to take a closer look at All Savers Alternative Funding from United Healthcare. MMAC has partnered with United Healthcare to offer coverage for groups from 5 to 99 employees. And now small businesses can take advantage of the benefits reserved normally for only large companies. Benefits including things like underwriting more competitive pricing, better data so your business understands where your premium dollars are going, and potential surplus refunds if claims are lower than expected. So if you're interested in that, I'd urge you to contact your MMAC broker or visit uhc.com backslash MMAC to learn more. Also wanted to um, have a couple programming notes and draw your attention to a couple upcoming events. First of all, uh, on May 6th, we will be hosting our annual Madison Night in Milwaukee. It's especially appropriate that Representative Rodriguez, Representative Boyke are here. This is our event where we invite our state legislators down to Milwaukee. We show off our city and its amenities to them and have a great networking opportunity for all of you. And so if you're interested in this uh, safe, uh, socially distanced event on May 6th, um, I encourage you to go to, uh, I think there's a link that Chris has put in our chat box uh, to register. It's a great, great opportunity to network with your elected officials and let them know what's on your mind and let them hear or hear from them what's on their mind. Uh, one other final event that I'd like to mention um, is Milwaukee 7 on May 26th. We'll have an economic development forum. Uh, this half day virtual forum is titled The Great Reset. Rebuilding into the new normal, the COVID-19 crisis has placed the leaders of southeastern Wisconsin at a crossroads, balancing short-term challenges with long-term uncertainties and opportunities. If you can join us at this event, uh, we'll have a discussion about strategies around talent, innovation, business development, and community as we work to strengthen our regional economy. We're pleased to have Amy Liu from Brookings Institution as our featured speaker on that event. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Representative Rodriguez and Representative Goike. Uh, Representative Jesse Rodriguez uh, represents the 21st Assembly District, which covers the cities of Oak Creek and South Milwaukee, and a little piece of Franklin. She was elected in a special election in 2013 and is a graduate of Marquette University. Representative Goike represents the 18th Assembly District, which is in kind of northwestern Milwaukee. Do you have a little nibble of Tosa in there too, Evan? Uh, you're, absolutely well, not. No, no, absolutely <laughs> not. not. Uh, Evan was elected to the assembly in 2012 and uh, is also a Marquette graduate, graduating from Marquette Law in 2009. So a, a proud day on our webinar for the Golden Eagles today. So uh, <clears throat> Evan and Jesse, as I've mentioned, are members of the Joint Committee on Finance. It's a committee that's pretty unique in the entire nation in terms of its scope and its power, and they will be um, reconstructing or constructing the state's $90 billion uh, biennial budget. And so, uh, Jesse and Evan, first of all, thanks for joining us. And uh, I'm gonna start where I'm sure everybody's minds are, and that's process. And nobody cares about process, but I did, wanna, I did wanna touch about it. 
because you're in a unique position as representatives on the finance committee. As I, I talked about your districts, you represent your own individual constituencies and your own individual areas, but you're tasked with creating a budget document and a blueprint for the entire state. And so could you talk a little bit about how you approach that job as a member of that important committee and how you um, balance those priorities kind of uh, differently than a normal rank and fire le file legislator might. So maybe we'll start with you, Representative Rodriguez. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Emma Macy, for hosting this and for having me on today. So um, I am uh, newly appointed to the Joint Committee on Finance. So prior to um, this session, most of my uh, um, work when it came to the budget cycle was making sure that my constituency um, knew that there was a budget going on and that we were considering uh, funding uh, different areas of interest and also getting feedback from them. Uh, to me, it was always important to make sure that my community was um, comfortable with the proposals that we had in the budget and uh, wanting to hear from them on areas that they felt were uh, areas of priority for them. The difference this time is that I still have to do that, but I also uh, do something else. Um, as a member of Joint Finance, we have a handful, I have a handful of um, colleagues on the assembly side um, that are considered my budget buddies. So my work is not only just making sure that my community is um, comfortable with the budget that we are putting together, but also that the members who are my budget buddy uh, 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 members are also comfortable with the budget and I am supposed to take input from them and provide that input to uh, the other members of joint finance so that way we can build consensus uh, with the budget. Representative Goyke. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Thank you for hosting. Um, it is a, a, a really, it's a challenge. You mentioned about $90 billion of uh, state and federal funding over two years in just about every area that state government touches. So you have to be uh, a jack of all trades and a master of none as you need to be nimble to go from issue to issue to issue. Um, I represent and live in an intensely urban district in the, in the city, um, one of the smallest geographic districts, but you know, I'm going to vote on um, proposals that impact dairy farmers and very rural townships. I have more people that live on my block than some of the small towns that are going to get broadband expansion grants uh, that are in the budget. So it takes a lot of learning. It takes a lot of listening to really understand how these programs work. But you never truly lose sight of the people that sent you to Madison. So Representative Rodriguez and I, as she mentioned, you know, continue to do our own education and advocacy within our own districts. But I'm, I'm never going to lose sight of who has sent me here. So I mentioned broadband. Uh, my community doesn't need the same kind of broadband expansion grants that some of the rural communities do, but we still have an access issue. There's, there's, there's still, uh, uh, you know, areas of my community where high-speed internet isn't really available. So it gives us opportunities to find um, shared need. So if we're gonna do $200 million in broadband expansion grants, what is there to benefit a small rural community that could also benefit uh, an urban neighborhood at the same time? We have similar underserved status. So how can we craft budget proposals that help both communities? And in many of these different instances, we're more united than we think we are, even though you, you know, demographically or in density, they're very, very different communities, but really they're struggling with the same thing. Let's, let's stick with you for a minute uh, here, Representative Doike. Uh, you know, you mentioned some of the things you're already looking at, but as you represent your district and also as you look at the budget as a whole, what are some of the top priorities you're looking at? You know, I know there's, a, you said there's a huge scope, but maybe you can narrow it down to just a few of the top priorities that you're going to be focusing on. Well, for me personally, um, I think that the, the most important single item in the governor's proposal is um, expanding the eligibility of the Badger Care program in Wisconsin. This is not a new fight in Madison or debate in Madison, uh, but 38 states in the District of Columbia have uh, expanded eligibility to 138% of the federal poverty guidelines of somebody making about $17,500 a year being eligible for subsidized health coverage. And this year in particular, the reason why I say that this number, that this is priority number one is 
the state would receive a savings of about uh, $1.6 billion over the next two years. And obviously, I've got plans for that $1.6 billion as well, and it could go to a lot of other areas. Now, the, the governor's uh, budget includes areas where I think we can find a lot of agreement. Um, I mentioned broadband already. We're hearing a lot of need in the long-term care and skilled nursing facilities. Um, there's a lot of provisions to increase grants that are available under the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. And then two additional pieces that are really important to my district, Steve. One is criminal justice system reform, uh, which uh, has been a really uh, bipartisan success across the country. And then there are some provisions that haven't gotten a lot of attention yet regarding housing, uh, workforce housing, uh, programs that help people save for buying a house. Uh, and, you know, in, in my community, we, we really have a, a shortage of housing. And I don't, I think that's a shared need across the state in suburban, rural, and urban. So I think those are some areas we can find some agreement um, this spring on the budget. Great. Representative Rodriguez, as you head into the budget, uh, I'm sure you may have some priorities that dovetail with uh, Representative Goikis, but you also have some unique to you. So uh, your turn. That's correct. Um, uh, I think a lot of the, some of the areas that uh, Representative Goiki, I think we are in agreement with uh, the broadband. I too are, are in an area of the state where we have a lot of broadband access. And the only thing we hear from our, my area is really the speed uh, of it, and, but not really the, uh, the ability to get access to broadband. So, but it is an area that I, I think we've heard of, uh, from many, many stakeholders, whether it be the schools, the public libraries, and even uh, a lot of the economic development uh, organizations around the state who have asked for, for us to look at uh, increasing broadband. So that, I think that's an area that we're gonna certainly look at. And I think we can definitely uh, build a lot of consensus on that. On my, with regards to my area, um, I have a lot of conversations with my school districts. They constantly talk to me about um, their needs. And so as member of the Joint Committee on Finance, I've been uh, tasked to uh, look at that issue here in the DPI. So I'll be work, I'm working on, on that issue here with my community, but also with uh, the members of um, the caucus. Uh, to make sure that everyone's comfortable with whatever plan we have, uh, we put forth to address our educational needs. Uh, most uh, things that I hear as far as education, it's more funding for mental health and special education. We keep hearing that over and over. And we, we did provide some increased funding last uh, biennium, but I think this is an area that I think we could find consensus and we could uh, certainly um, uh, work on that and seeing if we could get more uh, bi uh, bipartisan uh, uh, consensus on that. Um, but, we'll, you know, it, it starts with a lot of discussion and that's what we're doing right now. Thanks. And, you know, I think it's interesting listening to both of you. I, in some ways, the best kept secret in Madison is how much that both parties agree on. You know, the, the partisan fights get all the headlines, but you know, the vast majority of things are, uh, are issues that the, that the parties work together on. And just listening to the two of you there was interesting hearing, you know, the number of issues where, you know, that you're aligning on and where there's agreement between the parties uh, in working towards solutions. Now, the other th side of that coin is obviously there are some things that uh, are likely to be some, uh, some pressure points. And we don't want to gloss over those. And one of the neat opportunities here is I think people can hopefully see the interaction on those opposing sides and understand that there can be civil ways to, to interact and argue. So let's get into where you think some of the, the major tension points might be. Uh, Representative Rodriguez, we'll start with you. Sure. Well, Representative Goyke actually mentioned one thing that he thought was a, a priority for him, which was expansion of uh, of Medicaid's um, uh, program. And for us, uh, we cannot support something like that. As he had said, we are getting an incentive from the federal government, but it's a one-time incentive. Uh, we also know that the biggest problem for uh, the state of Wisconsin is not so much the uh, access to healthcare, but instead is the reimbursement rate from the federal government. And uh, since uh, the Affordable Care Act was put in place, initially it was 100% uh, federal match. Now we're seeing that in many states, it's gone down to 90%. And when we look at our you know, Medicaid uh, problem in the state of Wisconsin, 
we get only 60 cents out of a dollar for um, Medicaid uh, patients. So that means that um, uh, many or many hospitals, many healthcare providers make up the difference by increasing the cost of healthcare for those private payers. That's actually the biggest problem um, that we have in the city of Wisconsin. We also hear from school districts who are saying we only get 28 percent or to a 28 cents out of a dollar from the federal government in order to provide special education. Again, that just shows that, you know, as much as the federal government tries to incentivize uh, states to expand, eventually uh, they, they will not be able to provide the match. And it, it is left up to the, the state to be able to make up the difference. Unfortunately, we fiscally, it is impossible to be able to do that, to expand and eventually in, in a, um, a, a downturn of the economy, force us to, do, to make cuts either to the program or either to other, other priorities we have around the state. And um, unfortunately, we, we're not supportive of that. So that's one area. Um, the the uh, legalizing marijuana was another area that I believe uh, we don't have any agreement on. Uh, I think that is uh, an area that, that needs to be, um, need, needs to have a more robust public discussion on instead of being included in, in, in a, in a budget bill. Um, other things like repealing Act 10, I've heard from uh, organizations and even school districts who, who have felt that repealing um, Act 10 really wouldn't work, wouldn't be good for our um, stakeholders. Uh, many of uh, the school districts have been able to incur savings as a result of Act 10. And I think, you know, um, repealing that will just not move, move us forward, instead it will move us backwards. Thank you, Representative Rodriguez. Uh, Representative Goyke, any, uh, obviously the things that uh, were mentioned there are controversial points. Any other things that you can think of where you think there's gonna be a uh, disagreement between the parties? Yeah, I wanna, I wanna highlight three. Uh, and it's not going to surprise Steve Boss that my first issue is uh, local government funding. You know, the Metro Milwaukee, you know, our, the way the state of Wisconsin funds local government needs to be modernized. We need to be able to issue and retain our own sales tax. Like most cities the size of Milwaukee and America have that power. Uh, the, the, the bar to that is the state legislature. The governor's budget has a proposal that would allow counties and cities of a certain size to issue that tax. It has um, met with resistance and, and it's a problem that predates COVID and it's gonna be with us until we solve it. So funding local government is, is a priority. I think our University of Wisconsin system needs a massive influx. Um, we have to fund the freeze. So we have since 2013 frozen in-state tuition, which I think is a good policy, but we have to put money behind it so that there aren't cuts in quality or programs or services or amenities on campus. Uh, and I, I just think, especially in, in Metro Milwaukee, UWM is such a driver of our economy. It's such a, um, a gem and, and underappreciated institution. And then the third piece is public transit. And it kind of goes along with that local government piece. You know, the Metro Milwaukee is big enough to have some modernized public transit system that's that's growing and, and um, attracts and retains young people. I look at peer cities around the country and it's a commonality, the shared common uh, feature that we don't have and we don't have any kind of mechanism like a regional transit authority or any kind of structure that could put that in place. Um, you know, just want to respond briefly to Medicaid. You know, it used to be maybe it was controversial before the majority of Americans, um, you know, American states passed it. But it's one billion dollars. It is one time, as, as Representative Rodriguez mentioned. But imagine if all we did was put one billion dollars into the bank, into a, a, a interest earning account. You could fund those future costs by just living off of the in, uh, the interest earnings if you just put a billion in the bank. And you know, so. You know, th this argument that we're not going to be able to afford the program if we expand has not come true in other places. And President Biden certainly isn't going to repeal the Affordable Care Act. I don't think 74 senators are going to, to vote to do that either. So it's here to stay. And it's something that I think we should uh, we should expand. Can we can we write you down for that proposal of taking it and putting it in the bank? You going to assure that we don't spend it? 
I, hey, it's, it, 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 the reality is this, this is actually saved state general purpose revenue. We could do whatever we want with it. It's the freest. So I, I just put it out there. An endowment like account could be a use for the money, a way to use one time money to think long term. Great. Why not shift to one area? That, go ahead, Jesse. Well, because I mean, it, it is a one time money. You know, as we hear from constituents who are asking us to expand the program, they said, let's put it into mental health. Let's put it into, you know, uh, senior care. Let's put it into all, all these many things that they would like to prioritize. Unfortunately, it's not never going to be enough. And when you put one time funding, uh, it becomes part of the base. So it's, it's to say that it's just one time and we'll just use, you know, do a program and that's it. No, it never works that way because people are expecting us to be able to fund that two years down the road. So while it may be one-time funding that, as, as many people have said, they wanted to go to healthcare, but as we hear, it sometimes doesn't go to healthcare or to address uh, our healthcare needs. It also creates e eventually that uh, expectation that the state is going to fund it. And that's the problem that uh, we find ourselves is the fact that we may not be able to guarantee that we're going to be able to pay for those programs in the future. And, and that really does put us in a tough situation because no one wants to cut from health care. One, one other uh, uh, item that came in in the, in the chat, a question where there seems to be some disagreement, but I, I think uh, we may hear between the two of you that there's there's some agreement within the disagreement, and that relates to the educational uh, options uh, that particularly we have here in the city of Milwaukee and Milwaukee County, and how do we um, maintain continued uh, sufficient support for things like independent charters, choice schools, MPS, and all of the options we have here, particularly in the, uh, in the light of some of the uh, proposals in the governor's budget that would roll back access to those programs, and in the light of the educational fallout uh, from COVID. So I'm, I'd be interested in thoughts you'd have in response to that question we got in the chat about uh, funding those educational options as we come out of COVID and as we try and keep a robust uh, environment of quality education opportunity for children in Milwaukee. And we'll start with you, Representative Rodriguez. So I know that the governor has uh, basically asked for a freeze on these programs. And unfortunately, these that's not supported. Uh, these, these programs exist and they're not going to go away. Uh, he may want to do that, but politically, I think that that would be a, a huge struggle. Many people in Milwaukee and the Racine area or areas where the programs have existed, they are, they support, the community supports these programs as options for their community. So politically, I think he, uh, I think that would be, um, difficult to overcome the amount of, um, uh, disagreement from communities who already have the program, uh, uh, and I don't think that the governor could possibly uh, win that argument. Um, right now, we're just going to leave the 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 um, programs alone. Uh, they're growing, and we're going to allow them to grow. Uh, we are going to pull out that uh, portion of the governor's budget because we certainly don't agree with that. We, I, I'm a supporter of school choice. I'm a supporter of uh, charter schools, independent charter schools. Um, I think that that is good for our communities and to, to basically tell parents that we know better, I think is the wrong message. Representative Goyke to you, this one's really real to you because there's 50,000 kids in uh, Milwaukee who are in one of those alternative uh, systems. So your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, well, first of all, the governor's budget doesn't cancel or end these programs. It freezes enrollment. And the reason for the freeze is to understand the impact on the traditional public school system and the financial long-term fiscal viability. Look, here's the, here's the real rub. Where, where are we going to be in 10 years or 20 years? Um, if MPS's enrollment continues to decline, and part of that through the expansion and eligibility and enrollment in the private voucher system, what happens? So we can look at other states that have had uh, decentralization or uh, the breakup of their largest metro school district. You look at New Orleans or Detroit. And um, the, the, the argument that the governor is making is that we have to press pause to understand what those uh, financial implications are long term. Because what happens if MPS's enrollment declines to a certain, there's a, there's a breaking point on the horizon 
And whether the majority party wants to believe it or not, that some of those fixed costs, some of those um, structural issues like uh, pension payments and everything, it, it, I don't know what the state's responsibility is going to be, what the fiscal note is going to be statewide to taxpayers if we get to that date uh, on the horizon. So the governor is saying, pause, those programs have grown um, tremendously over the last year. The creation of the statewide system, the special needs voucher program, increased enrollment uh, eligibility, the reduction or removal of caps in the statewide program that are set to take place in the, couple of, in the next couple of years. So the governor's proposing taking a pause. And I, I think that there, this is a conversation that we haven't had, is what is the long-term plan? What, what does it look like to have multiple statewide school systems? And, and, and where are we gonna be in 10 years or 20 years? And that's why the governor's proposing pressing a pause. And I am not surprised at all to hear that the majority party is disagreeing with that pause. And so, you know, it, it's gonna be a, a debate that we're going to have to have in earnest in the years to come. Thanks. I know we're running uh, short on time, but I wanted to throw one more question from uh, our audience in, in this regards workforce development and kind of talent development. Uh, any ideas you have or priorities or thoughts you have heading into this budget of how we create um, or expand workforce development programs to, to fuel a growing economy we've got here in Wisconsin? Representative Goyke, you're on my screen. Let's yeah. start with well, it's, it's that Madison doesn't know best, The locals are best situated for filling local needs. And there are some provisions in the governor's budget that would send money out to local workforce boards, kind of regionalize things a little bit more. Uh, I would love to see some of our economic development dollars be, be leveraged better with local lenders like community development financial institutions uh, so that you know, the state dollars get broken into smaller pots. I'm on the north, I'm in the near west side on the north side of Milwaukee. We have some big projects that could happen in, our, in my district, which would be really exciting. But the majority of economic development projects that we have are smaller. They're not $10 million projects, they're $200,000 projects. And the state has traditionally done a really bad job of breaking up those dollars into that smaller amount. And in all honesty, we're gonna need some local help, some local boots on the ground with some people that know the, those communities a little better, better than the state government. And the governor's budget takes a step in that direction. Representative Rodriguez? Yeah, I think there's, a, I, I, I can agree with some of the stuff that Representative Goyke uh, mentioned. Um, so some of the things that the governor proposed in his budget is increased funding for youth apprenticeship programs, uh, economic development grants. And I think those are really good um, things for our communities. Um, I, and I, I do agree that locally, having uh, the locals uh, be able to manage and uh, use these funds is the best approach. I think of uh, a, um, a business consorti consortium that it, uh, is uh, located right outside my district, but they work with a lot of businesses in my, in my district and the local tech college and the, the high schools. And that work right there has... Uh, has um, allowed uh, my area to increase uh, more individuals into the trades um, and uh, doing something like dual enrollments as well. So I think those are good things, not only for the business community, but it's also good things for our, our, our students or people who are looking to further their career into, you know, the, in, into either trades or any other economic development um, uh, area. So I think those are really good things that I, I think would help our communities. Great. And maybe before I let you go, we'd have one, uh, one little lightning round here for you um, that uh, addresses the $3.2 billion elephant in your room. Um, all of the federal funding, the funding that is coming down from the ARPA and the other uh, uh, stimulus programs, does that make your job from a budgeting perspective easier or harder? I guess we'll get out on kind of a simple, uh, you know, does that... It, complicate things for you or does it make it easier because there's more money flying around? Representative Rodriguez will get you first on this one. Uh, I guess it depends on uh, who you're talking to because uh, the way that the bill was crafted it certainly benefits certain school districts versus others. So, you know, I think that's where we're trying to figure out, you know, how do we, you know, uh, try to provide a balance between those school districts that don't benefit that well from the ARPA because most of the title, most of the funding, 90% of the funding will go directly to Title I school districts. Unless you have a huge population of Title I uh, students, 
uh, uh, the, those, school, the, those other school districts do not benefit. So we're trying to find an, uh, a balance for both. Representative Goyke. Uh, it complicates things, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's a bit of a delay in uh, passing a budget this year, uh, if there's a little bit of a delay getting that guidance from uh, Washington, D.C. There are some areas where the federal funding may overlap with some of the governor's initiatives in the budget. They're important. We need to get them done. We'll see how it all works out, but I think it complicates things in the short term. Great. Well, Representative Goyke, Representative Rodriguez, I want to thank you again. I know this is a session day. And we're keeping you from uh, your, your duties and your caucuses and on, on the floor. So I appreciate you giving us a, a half hour and uh, letting our global audience here on the World Wide Web get to know you a little bit better and get to learn a little bit more about the state budget. So thanks again um, and have a, have a great day. Thanks for all the work you're doing for us. Thank you, Steve. Thanks.